Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm Amanda from Guide for Geek Moms and Crazy Amanda Reacts. And actually, Chris, we've chatted before about the film. And mm -hmm. one of the things we discussed was the messaging and how it's so relevant to today. And as I was watching it, you know, it really struck out to me more and more, yeah. you know, the tendency for conflict and demonizing each other and stuff. And I was just wondering, as you were making the film and seeing these similarities in the world, did that have you pivot in any way in your storytelling? No, I mean, the, obviously we are products of our environment. And as we're, as we're creating a story, some of these ideas are just always are hovering in the room with you. And, 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 and you want to make a movie that has things that you care about and, and universal ideas in it. And if anything, it was, it was, it was sad to, to see that some of the thematic ideas in the movie were only becoming more relevant over the course of developing the movie. It takes three or four years to make an animated film. And, and as our themes, as our story, our plot was crystallizing and our themes were crystallizing, unfortunately, it, it became more and more um, a message that felt relevant. And on one hand, I really wanted to get out into the world, you know? Uh, there are ideas about this sort of cycle of, of aggression and revenge and, and demonizing of the other. And, and, um, and, and I think that was, um, and the, the idea that sometimes we are, we are taught to hate each other uh, uh, as, as a means of, of, of um, uh, solidifying power, you know, those, those are things that, that uh, it was, I was sad to see them manifesting more and more in our world. Um, but, you know, as an artist, you hope in, in some small way to be able to make a difference and to be able to be a voice. And, uh, and so hopefully it's, uh, it's, it becomes on some small level part of the conversation. Well, it definitely touched me. So thank you. Thank you. Tanya? Hi there. I am Tanya Lamb with Lola Lamb Chops, <clears throat> excuse me, dot com. And um, so my question is for Zarius. Um, I'm also the mom of five girls. And so I love characters that have some spunk and sass to them. Um, so how did you feel when you first saw Maisie and how do you relate to her? It was really amazing to first see her because I don't think that there is very many um, characters like Maisie in animation. And I mean, it's something that it's, it's growing and it's becoming more and more apparent. And I think that's really cool. But to, to see her and uh, in in her appearance and then her characteristics being very uh, feisty and confident, I think that was something that really, really made me happy. And I hope it makes a lot of other girls happy as well. I'll just add to that to say that when we would get into these sessions, um, uh, uh, Zaris is obviously a really, really uh, sweet kid. But once that mic turns on and she's Maisie, it's like, who is this person? You know, it was, the, it was this really powerful performance. And uh, so she was, I, I would say that she's, uh, as an actor, she's mature beyond her years. You know, she really became this, this, this powerful force. But I think there's some of her in Maisie in that regard as well, because Zaris is, a, is an amazing actor, but also singer, dancer, and, and she just, she loves to perform and is so passionate about it and is so driven towards it. And, and, uh, and I, th I think you feel some of that um, in some of that dedication, some of that fire you, you feel in the character. Robin? Hi, I'm Robin Davis from momdemagnificent.com. Thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, my question is for you, Chris. Could you share with us a little bit about um, what's the inspiration behind this film? Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is a movie that has been, I think, <laughs> in me all my life. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved the, the, the Ray Harryhausen stop motion films. I loved the Sinbad movies, Clash of the Titans. Um, I, I love the uh, King Kong was a big one for me as a kid. Raiders, Lawrence of Arabia, those kind of sprawling epic adventure stories really got me excited about m telling stories and making movies. And, and I used to make little stop motion films with my dad in my bedroom. And, and I was trying to approximate that, <laughs> that tone or that personality, that flavor in the, in the movies that I was making, even as a kid. So I think it was always in me. And I think just over time, 
as I worked on a, on, on other films, I kept having having this this nagging thought that that I would like to someday try to make a movie a pure action adventure story, a, a big epic that felt like one of those classic stories. I love it. Thank you. It really is a beautiful film. Oh, thank you. E and Tegan. Hi, I'm Tegan, and this is my mom, T. We're here with Sex in LA. And this is a question for both of you. So I really like seeing many strong female hunters. My favorite was Sarah Sharp, and she's brave and loyal. And did you make it a point to feature women, and especially women of color, playing characters that we usually see men play? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, the, the nice thing was we were trying to make a world that felt very plausible and 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 so we went to a specific sort of time and place as a reference point uh but it's a fantasy story it's a made-up world and so because of that we were able to to create uh diversity on our ships and in, in our world that more resembled our world today um and so we definitely wanted to seize that opportunity um and and then yeah it's it's clear that there there the gender doesn't play a role in your your assignment on the ship and and sarah's an incredibly uh, authoritative and potent uh, warrior, um, and and we definitely wanted to make sure that we we did right by her. You know that we gave her opportunities to be very powerful, very strong. Uh, whether that is in her in her in her um, the, the action scenes, uh, or just the way she carries herself um, in the in the in the in the on the ship, you know. Um, and so yeah, that that was, that was something that we knew we wanted to do um, from day one, really. Zareth, did you want to, do you have any of the, I mean, Zareth brought so much fire to that character, to the character of Maisie. Um, really, to be honest, because I was not involved in making the, as in like the design of the characters, all I can really say is thank you to Chris and the rest of them for doing that, because it's very inspiring. And a lot of, uh, I think, girls of color will really, really feel connected to it as well just like I did and that wouldn't be possible without them so mm. that's just my <laughs> well and, and just quickly I will say though <laughs> that, that 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 animation is we're trying to create a feeling of of it being alive and spontaneous and give it a vibrance but animation is a very slow and deliberate process so you make these you agonize over decisions that over the course of of, of those years and and everything you see on screen is a choice. And so there's a danger of it feeling kind of stagnant. So it really falls to the actors to, to bring that, that, that feeling of spontaneity. And, 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 it, and if the performances aren't great, the animators have nothing to work with and the movie just dies. So it was totally predicated on, on uh, Zeris and the other actors um, uh, really bringing it home. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Victor? Hi, my name is Victor. I'm from uh, fandance.com. Uh, thank you, Chris and Zaris, for being here with us today. Uh, my question is about the boat, the inevitable. Um, it's, it's, I mean, inevitable means unavoidable. So you know that something is going to happen to it. Um, was there like a hidden meaning with naming the boat the inevitable? inevitable? <laughs> well, um, it, it was definitely, it sounded cool, right? So you definitely have to check that box, right? You're going to be on the ship the whole movie. It's got to sound cool. Um, but I think it does suggest that the, the actions that the characters are taking and the way that they are is going to lead them to some inevitable um, conclusion, right? That, this, that, that, that especially when the, when our, when the, captain, uh, the captain of the ship starts to become very sort of narrow in his, in his thinking um, and, and really bent on revenge, um, there, that, that's going to take him to a place um, that, that is, is, is I, I keep using the word inevitable, but I can't think of a better one. So it's going to take, take him to some inevitable conclusion. You know, it was almost like it was written that, that they were going to end up in a certain situation. Uh, so I think there is some meaning beyond it just sounding cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia? Hi, my name is Olivia Douglas. I'm with this and that with Olivia.com. My question is for Zaris. Uh, how do you get into your character? Well, I think getting into the role of Maisie, it's, it's more of a gradual thing than just like, I think from the first line, 
I am already there. But as we continue to record, we will record for like a few hours. And as we do it, I get more and more like comfortable because I, I, I get very nervous beforehand. So I, I tend to go quite quiet. And my family knows that like when I'm on the way to the studio, we don't really talk that much because I'm trying to like focus. <laughs> um, but And I also watched a lot of... Um, Leading up to being Maisie, I watched a lot of characters like her. So if I say Moana, I'd watch that quite mm -hmm. often. And <laughs> I'd watch characters that are similar. So I'd have an idea of how to be her. But then I'd also bring my own self into it a bit. So, yeah. Well, you did a phenomenal job. So thank you. Thank you. Back up to Amanda. Well, I loved the monsters. I loved them and I thought, I just loved their design and, and the personality and all of them. And uh, my, so my first question is, is there gonna be any toy line? Because I need me a blue plush, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you know, how did you come up with all these designs in, for the monsters? <laughs> I think they are, um, I think they're we're gonna be making some blue plushes for the, the crew. Um, so we'll try to get you one, okay? Uh, <laughs> um, as far as the, how we sort of the design process, um, it is it is a, a, a months and even years long process, you know, and, and a lot of it goes is is it starts with the research and really understanding how these uh, the, these sea mammals, how they're built, you know, characters, creatures that especially um, are can be on land and water that are more comfortable in the water that dictate dictates a lot of their physiology. And so we would look at a lot of images, but also a lot of videos of walruses and sea lions and, and, and whales and things like that and, and understand how they move and understand their physiology. Because I think if you, for a world like this that feels more plausible and more realized, if there's something that feels like it wouldn't work in the real world, you kind of, the audience would sense it. So you can't just make up whatever you want, right? So you have to start with a physiology that makes sense and then you build off of that. Then, then the designers can bring their imagination to it. Um, and, uh, and then you're just trying to, to, to create designs that fit the personality. So our, 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 uh, our main sea monster had to have a certain majesty to her. And so we would look at tigers and lions and things like that and, uh, and, 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 and see what we could glean from that. And you, you start to pull from a lot of different uh, uh, sources um, so you're not just copying any one thing, right? And uh, and 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 after sort of what it's an it's it's an amazing I have an amazing uh, uh, perspective here because I get to see all of the drawings and all the ideas that didn't make it in the movie, right? And there's just countless, endless. Like I, I I'm so lucky to do what I do for a living because I walk into a room where a designer has filled the room with these incredible images. Um, you know, someone who's, who's, who's so great at what they do and they bring their talent to bear and they present all this stuff. And then it's my job to say, well, none of this, just this, you know, or, or like these three things. And then the rest of them almost kind of evaporate and the world never gets to see them. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly not, you, you can't just go down the first avenue. You have to, you have to go down a lot of different roads before you arrive at the design. Well, it sounds like you have material for a second one, plenty of material for a second one there. So <laughs> oh, we, we have so much material. You have, you have no idea. <laughs> Anya? So audiences love that they're Easter eggs. Are there any fun Easter eggs that they can look for in this movie? There is, um, with this movie more than other ones I've worked on, I really wanted to have this feeling of an immersive world. I didn't want to break the spell. I was very conscious of that. So I didn't want to place anything that was literally, oh, that's a thing from another movie. But there are a couple of places, a couple of shots where we were um, referencing very specifically Jaws. Um, and and uh, which makes sense, you know, you're this big threatening creature that lives in the ocean. Um, but there were a couple of places that where we were, we, we tried to sort of match uh, shots that you would have seen in Jaws. Awesome, thank you. Robin. Okay, so this is a really wonderful adventure movie. I'd love to hear from both of you. What's your all-time favorite adventure movie? 
Uh, do you want me to go first, Zaris? Well, I, I don't know because I don't really have a favorite. <laughs> so, yeah, you can go. <laughs> I, I mean, okay. Um, the, uh, uh, for me, the, uh, when I was a kid, of course, I love Star Wars. Everyone's got to love Star Wars. Mm -hmm. But I didn't collect Star Wars cards. But I did collect King Kong cards. The, and the, the, I know the 70s version of King Kong is, is generally not considered like the, the great version of King Kong, but it was my version, right? And I just loved it. And I think it was just something about this uncharted island, this, this, this world of mystery that lays beyond the horizon that was so compelling and captivating for me. And then to create this, this creature that is so massive in scale, but you also ultimately feel empathy for, um, that to me was an amazing trick. Um, and, and so I think that was, a, that was a big one for me. Um, and, uh, but you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that was, I don't, I think I left that theater a different person. Uh, <laughs> I was, I think I left feeling like I need to make movies. Um, so that I think would be, would be another one. Um, so yeah, those, those, and I, I loved all the stop motion movies when I was a kid. I love Clash of the Titans. I love the Sinbad stories, all those things just there, there'll always be in me. <laughs> and this was my chance. This is my 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 chance to exercise all of those these those things that always kind of got me excited about about movies. Yeah, you can see a little bit of all of that in this in this movie, which is really cool. <laughs> and and Zara, so so there's not a particular adventure story that you think is like the the one. Have you you probably haven't seen Goonies, right? Have you seen Goonies? <laughs> no. Have you ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? No. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta make like yourself a long list of movies to watch then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do like a lot of adventure movies. Um, I do, especially animation ones. I, I also really like anime. Me and my brother mm -hmm. will have a day where we just binge anime, and there's a lot of like adventure um, mm -hmm. uh, stories in those. So, I, yeah, very fun. Thank you. There is very much a gener generational thing here, right? Like I'm referencing Raiders, which is a, in a way ancient history for, for a younger person, you know? Definitely. <laughs> ENT again. Hi, this is for Chris. Um, I thought the ships looked beautiful. Um, what research was done in regards to creating the look of the hundred ships and life at sea? Oh my gosh. You wouldn't believe the research <laughs> because we really, as I said, we really wanted people to, to be teleported to this world and really believe in it. Right. And so you can't fake that stuff. If you're, if you're fudging it, people can tell. And so, and I don't know very much about ships. I actually get kind of seasick, honestly. And so, uh, but we, I went to these uh, Naval museums. I went on these classic ships. They allowed me to kind of pull on ropes and figure out how it worked and, we sent team, all of our artists went and spent some time on these ships. And we went down to the, the ship that's, that's moored in, in San Diego, where they actually shot master and commander as, as one example. And, and, and we had this, this, um, an expert named Gordon Lacko, who was the consultant on master and commander, which is a movie that is generally sort of held up as one of the best examples, the most authentic examples of, of life at sea from that era. Um, so he was a consultant for that, really knows his stuff, really passionate. So I could turn to him and, and, and ask him how the ships worked, how the crews functioned, how this organism of the ship and the crew together, how that all worked, and, and things like the terminology, the weaponry, things like that, even the tactics. You know, we, um, the, I, had, I used to have a big map up on my wall here that, that was a map of the opening battle scene. Um, because we really worked that out and we wanted it to make sense according to the wind direction, right? Because obviously wind direction is critical for, for, these, uh, for these, these tall ships. And, and so as, as you're watching these action scenes, especially that first one, we wanted to make sure that this, this, the rigging and the sails were, were being executed, were being um, uh, 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 positioned correctly and that the wind was affecting those sails in the correct way. And that's and and the and the right people were pulling on the right ropes to, to to execute those maneuvers, and those are things that probably you don't specifically the audience is probably as they're kind of caught up in the story and the action they're probably not specifically noticing that consciously, but I think on an unconscious level you feel it, and that's what we want to do is is to make all these these little correct choices so that unconsciously the audience is feeling like they're in a, in an actual place. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. It looked awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I was very happy with how the ship turned out. And uh, I think I've, I've, I've mentioned this in the past, but uh, in Moana, the, the, the boat had that she was on had like maybe like 10 ropes or something. Um, and, and it was, it almost sank the whole production. Those ropes were so challenging from a technical standpoint. And now, now here we are, me not learning my lesson and setting the next movie on this giant tall ship that has literally hundreds of ropes. And, but we wanted to get it right. And, and these, that's the way these ships were. And, and, and so we, we rose to the challenge or we, I mean, the, our artists and our, and our, our technicians rose to the challenge um, and created this, this ship that, that has ropes everywhere and, and it all works and it all is all functions in an authentic way. Victor. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, I, the question I have is uh, for Zaris at the beginning, when you're exiting the, the orphanage, you, you yell out to your friends uh, to, 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 I think it's, um, to die a good death as you walk out. Do you think that throughout the progress of your movie, your thinking of that line changes after what you've experienced? It, it cut out for a bit, would you mind repeating? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, when, when you're exiting the orphanage, you yell out to your friends like to, to live a good life and to die a good death. But as mm -hmm. your experience through, the, through the, what you go through in the movie, I, I don't wanna give too much away, do you think that your thought of that line changes, like for the character, does I, she think something differently now? Yeah, I think it definitely does. Cause I think that is like the beginning Maisie where she is a big monster hunting fan and she's uh, trying to become like her parents were. And I think dying a great death or dying in battle was kind of honorable and um, makes you seem like a hero if you die a certain way and I don't think that those deaths are very um very pleasant and um, I think it's more about uh, by the end it's more about living life and living a great life not expecting and hoping for an epic death you know so, yeah I think it changes I, I couldn't have said it better <laughs> and Olivia this question is for Chris. Uh, what is the prime message you would like viewers to get out of the film? It's phenomenal. I truly enjoyed it, but just curious of the overarching like theme or message. Yeah, I, 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 that's a great question. And and this was a movie where I, I was clear at the beginning. I don't. It's not just about one thing. That there are multiple thematic ideas, multiple ideas that that intersect and talk to each other. And and I've heard from people who take very different things away from the film, which I love. You know because. Because I have an idea of what it is, what the central idea is, but once it's out in the world, the audience—it's not up to me anymore. You know, they can—they it's—it's up to them. Um, so, again, there were multiple ideas. The one that I was that for me was the one that was the center um, was this idea of of this cycle of of aggression, this cycle of of revenge or violence that perpetuates itself, um, and the reasons why why that 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 or instigate those 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 terrible cycles and 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 ask the question how do we um escape from from that vicious circle um that's that i think is the is the center of it um examining the reasons why they exist and and how we can escape them that's great thank you so much chris thanks okay we have time for a couple more amanda well, Zarius, it, you were truly great in this. I mean, Chris mentioned everybody else did. I thought I was so convinced that, you know, you did so well. I was like, she must have a ton more animated parts under her belt. But then I looked and this was your first animated film. So I was just wondering how difficult was that for you to transition into? And did you do you have a preference now? Are you ready to do more animation? Um, yeah, I had done. I had done a, a series on it junior a while back, but that was a lot different because um, I was doing the English like version of it. There was already an American one out. So that one, I saw all the animation before it was out. I just would repeat the line um, from the original and say it in my accent, I guess. Um, so this was completely from scratch. I, I, didn't get, I, I didn't see anything before we started or anything like that. 
and it has been an amazing, amazing, amazing journey. And animation has always been a big passion of mine. I just love the idea of creating life and different people and characters and anything you really want. It's always fascinated me. So it's always going to be something I want to do. Well, yeah, I, I, I think was, that. Oh, oh sorry. Just just to to follow up, I I um the Zaris was sorry Zaris was um the, the there was there was such a spark that happened the moment she took control of this character, you know. And a lot of people don't realize that 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 we do the voice performance first, and then the animators animate to that. Some people sometimes people think that people animate that, that the animation is done first, and then the voice is dropped in. It's the reverse, and that way, that all all of the the spontaneity can be captured by the animator, and the animator can use the performance as a springboard for for their performance. Um, so so, in a sense, you know, May, Maisie was in her hands, and it was just incredible to see the the transformation. Uh, from Zaris to, to Maisie, um, it was it was uh, it was this instantaneous thing. Um, really, really sweet kid, and then suddenly Maisie. <laughs> and uh, and I think you know part of it is like that's not to say that Maisie is not in in, a, in her own way a sweet kid, and that she's a, a kid who wants to do good. You know, she's a, she's um, she believes in doing the right thing. It's just her sense of what is right evolves dramatically over the course of the story. Yeah, hey. I can't wait to see what's in her future. So that was incredible. Oh, Thank you. I would love to work with her again. I'll say that. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. 